Hello, I'm Derek Terry, host of I'm Not Complaining, I'm Just Saying. Here at one of my favorite spots, the barbershop, where we know if you're gonna complain here, then you better provide solutions. Good. It's good. I firmly believe when we make other people's problems part of our conversations without providing solutions or prayer, then we become part of the problem. I want to be able to provide people with a platform where they can freely express their views on such topics as education, social issues, health and fitness, and that's good, or sports. So please join me so we can complain and provide solutions together. Hey, what's going on, people? This is your man, Derek Terry, host of I'm Not Complaining, I'm Just Saying, where if you're going to complain, bring some solutions to the table. So welcome to episode seven, I'm sorry, season seven, episode 15, where my special guest is going to be uh, current Commissioner President Ruben Collins Esquire. So um, before we get started, um, as you can see, I always try to promote uh, organizations that are doing good things. And I want to share my screen. And for those that hear stuff in the background, I'm going to confess I've been put in the basement. I mean, not the basement, in the garage. So because I'm in the garage, um, that's where I'm going to be at. It's my permanent spot. I was told I was too loud. But anyways, um, real quick, I just want to give you a little background on Tri-County Love Center and uh, their goal. And primarily what they do, they um, provide temporary safe quality housing to women who need the structural recovery after substance abuse has ceased. And um, they're in the beginning stages. But if you get in, I would definitely encourage you to check out the website. It's uh, T as in Tango, C as in Charlie, LCCC.org. So that's TCLCCC.org. And um, it's a great organization that is doing great things uh, to help out uh, women um, who are recovering some substance abuse, but they'll also give them um, the right resources that they will need. So if you get an opportunity, once again, check out um, Tri-County Love Center. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to get into it. And just before we bring on uh, Commissioner Collins, I just want to put the disclaimer out there that my views are my views. Um, and um, I don't do any gotcha type questions. So every every commission every commissioner candidate, as well as board of education candidate, was sent an email to be a guest on the show. Some have accepted, some have not. Uh, for whatever reason, it is what it is. But I, this is my way as we enter the last month of uh, voter education series to give the uh, voters out there in Charles County, as well as just all out there, an opportunity to meet our candidates. But at the same time, wherever you're voting at, you should educate yourself on your candidates. And I'm providing a, a platform that gives them the opportunity to do that. And um, it's it just one of these things that said to me, elections are important. And you shouldn't just be voting just, just checking a box. You should make sure that whoever that candidate is, regardless of your political affiliation or ideologies, meets, uh, meets the needs of what you want, in which um, you hope that they do for you and your community. So uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and bring in our special guest. Once again, um, the current Charles County Commissioner President, who is running for re-election, Ruben Collins. I just realized something. Before I start, um, I wanted to address something real quick. Um, 
I am friends with a lot of elected officials. Um, some, I just may be a simple associate, but I'm friends. But what I will tell you, regardless of the friendship, I will check them and they will check me. I've always been fair. I, I've never been um, impartial. I've never been biased. I address the issues. I don't have any, I mean, any political aspirations or financial um, dealings that would benefit me from educating you about these candidates. So I just want to put that out there uh, because some people have the misconception that uh, I'm unfair. And I challenge you to look at any of the episodes I've done and find me something where I was unfair. Anybody who knows me, some people know me over 40 years. I am who I am, you get what you get. But what I'm not gonna let you do is run a hustle on me or anything that I try to do. So I just wanna put that out there. So once again, our special guest, current commissioner president, Ruben Collins, who's running for reelection. All right, so welcome, uh, Commissioner President Collins. And, and I have to say that because you currently are Commissioner President and there's nobody else on here. So just to, if I was being fair and somebody was on, I would call you Ruben Collins, but because it, this is your spotlight, um, you still have the title, so I'm still gonna call you uh, Commissioner Collins. So welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, so how's, how's the family? Family's doing well. Um, Everyone's getting older and wiser, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely attest to that. Hopefully my son will get wiser as he gets goes out of ninth to 10th grade. So uh, <laughs> looking forward to that. But uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, before we get into the platform and, and all the other stuff, tell us about uh, Ruben Collins, the person, not the commissioner president, the attorney, the person. I mean, I've, I've been a longtime resident of Southern Maryland. I was born in the District of Columbia, um, but my family moved to Charles County when I was uh, five years old. So I, I think it's safe to say that I, I'm someone from Southern Maryland in, in Charles County. Um, most of my life has been associated with public service. And um, quite frankly, that, that's something that I believe will be, you know, really till I hit the grave, you know, in some capacity uh, serving. Um, but I am, you know, I'm a family man, um, which is something I'm very proud of. Um, I think that's part of helping me grow as an individual, you know, actually having, you know, that perspective that, that's part of my life and seeing my children uh, grow and watching them prosper. I think that's really what life is all about because I, I think that's really why we do this stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm just thankful, you know, that I have a, a wife and family that actually care about me. You know, I, I think that's a good place to be. I don't know if I can make it simpler than that, but that's kind of who I am and where I am. All right, well, I definitely can attest to that. And what I always tell um, all the candidates is that uh, we have a lot of similarities. Um, you know, I'm appreciative that my wife and my family support me <laughs> in everything that I do. Um, public service is something that was instilled in me through my dad with the military. And, and I, I know, although you're a Kaplan, I'm an alpha. Public service is one of those things that we, we stay true and it really sticks to our heart. And what the audience may not know is that me and Ruben have been friends for a long time. But what I will tell you with every friendship, if you agree with that person 100% of the time, to me, you're not a true friend. Ruben tells me like it is. I tell him like it is. We've had times where we didn't speak for a while. You know, it happens. But like he said earlier, you get wiser, you get older or whatever you want to label it. And I definitely appreciate that and, and all that you do. But we do know, like anything, we're not always going to agree. But that's what I appreciate about our friendship. 
So yeah. that, that goes both ways. I mean, and that, that's that's why I appreciate that. I mean, you know, I mean, because believe it or not, I mean, even when we do disagree, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, I generally come from the discussion learning something. I mean, I mean, that's because, I mean, that's from the perspective that I've um, established as I've matured as a human being, you know, to, to actually, you know, it's one thing to disagree, but taking it to the le next level is having the ability to actually listen to what the conversation is about. Because too often when people are in agreement or we're, we're or, or disagreement or we're arguing, we're not even listening to each other, you know? So, anyway. Well, well, one of the things that, um, that, you know, there was parts of it where I agreed, parts where I disagreed. But, you know, as a commissioner president, as long as the other commissioners, all you had to deal with the COVID response. And I, I know, to tell you the truth, I'm glad I wasn't elected because I don't think that I would have been able to deal with the amount of pressure that y'all had to deal with. But w what was the most difficult challenge when dealing with the COVID response? Well, I... It's difficult if you start by a presumption that, okay, you have the answers and you're going to solve this. You know, they, they, then it becomes extremely difficult. But from the very beginning, I took the perspective that I'm going to follow the advice of, of uh, experts because we're dealing with a global pandemic. And at the end of the day, none of us had a clue as to what the results were gonna be. So from the very beginning, I, I took the position that, okay, I'm gonna rely on the expertise starting from the top uh, with the CDC, trickling down to the state of Maryland, and then uh, following suit with the direction coming from the health officer representing Charles County. So everything was in that context, you know, and, and so I, so other than those, uh, those early days, and it's funny, you know, it just so happened to be you. And I, I think it was through, a, a, I don't I think it was a tweet or something, maybe it was something on social media. That's how I became aware of the first incident of COVID of someone in Charles County. And I remember I, I, it drove me crazy. I was like, now how in the world can Derek Terry know about, you know, they, you know, cause that was like, you know, March of 2020. And I remember, if you recall, it was someone that was on uh, one of the bases, I think at Andrews or something, but they, they had a Charles County address. And so I, I just remember, you know, I was like, how do we allow this to get in here? You know, and, and the reality is, I mean, I was clueless. You know, no one knew what the next two and a half years would look like. None of us. But but answering your question, I mean, I was following, I was following the, the guidance of experts. Well, I'm, I'm being honest with you, I, I don't know how I found that. I, I forgot, but I, I know it was through a reliable source. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was being, true. And, it was and, true. And, being, and being that, you know, I, I do have the military background and being on bases. Um, but at, now one of the things, I want to see if I can share this screen real quick. Um, da, 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 da. working with technology here, people, and I'm outside. So where are we at? Oh, there we are. So uh, can you see that? Uh, yep. All right. So this is currently what we have on the Charles County Health Department website. So what I'm looking at right now is this right here. We we have I guess 50 new cases. Uh, there's 428 cases, and these are just reported cases. Right. Uh, since last week. Does this raise any concern to you or at speaking with the health officials or uh, a, a possible surge or because the hospitalizations uh, tend to be low right now, there's not immediate concern? I think you, really, I think you spelled it out because anyone that has been listening to um, the regular presentations from uh, Dr. Abney, our, our health officer, she, she provides you know, the numbers and the last two presentations that she's done, she's, she's definitely been spot on in recognizing these trends 
where we're seeing this trajectory. And, but her messaging is the same. She's still uh, telling, you know, the citizens to still, you know, maintain the same, uh, you know, uh, procedures, you know, to, to ensure that there's not a continual spread. Um, I think if you look across the board, I just think, and I, and it, I, this is just my opinion. I think we've reached a stage just on a uh, societal level where we almost don't want to acknowledge that, you know, these numbers are actually rising because nobody wants to get back to, you know, um, so-called enforcement of, you know, some of these uh, measures, you know, like wearing a mask you know, and not having the option to um, to wear a mask or not wear a mask. You know, I, I just see that across the board and, and I don't think it's limited to Charles County. I, you know, I'm run across and I'm sure you have as well, just within the last two or three weeks, people that I know personally that have contracted um, uh, COVID. But it's like the mindset now is vastly different than it was uh, pre-January 2020, uh, pre-March uh, 2022. Yeah, and that may be because some people have gotten vaccinated or got the first. I just got my second booster two days ago. So, and that may be the case because at that point, it's, it's probably like the regular flu to them. Right. Um, but like you had mentioned, we, we didn't know, we didn't know what we didn't know two years ago. And what, what I will say, it's, and before I move on to another topic, is that, you know, the, you were you and the commissioners were put in a situation that no one has been put in that I could think of during my lifetime. And you handled the best way you could, and everybody's not going to be happy. There were some parts where I wasn't happy, some parts where I was happy. But at the end of the day, it's really about the health. Um, luckily, our deaths have been low. And... Um, and we, we hope they stay low and, and we don't have any. And the cases, if they do go up, that people get the treatment and they feel better. So the next topic, and I, I know it's been a heated one, was with the property tax yield group. Um, recently, and I'll just make sure I got my verbiage right, um, the property tax rate for Charles County, I think it's $1.14 per 100 assessed value, where St. Mary's and Calvert is a little bit, it's about less, you know, as much as, uh, I guess 16 cent and one is about eight cent. Um, I, I guess what the residents are concerned with, and I understand the situation, your home values go up, so thus your taxes are gonna go up based on that. But I, I guess the underlying question is um, why the, um, the property tax yield rate couldn't have been lowered to ease the burden of the tax base. And what are the, the challenges with doing that? Well, the challenges, and I was hoping I could, you know, as part of your discussion, I could um, highlight some of the, the uh, more impressive uh, measures that are associated with uh, the FY 2023 budget that was just passed. Oh, yeah, we'll get, we'll um, get into that. Yeah. But, but one of the limitations uh, to uh, lowering that, that property tax rate is the most obvious limitation. It reduces actual revenue. And that revenue is how we pay for pro programs and services. So that would be the first thing. Um, I, the irony for me, I mean, because I was first elected in 2006 and that was at the closeout of that boom period you know, when you really look at when the, the county was growing at an extremely fast pace, it was during that period. Uh, and that was like the closeout period just before the Great Recession. And the irony for me listening to this discussion was back in those days, it was consistent that um, the more conservative uh, um, uh, activists in our communities were the ones that raised that exact same issue on the constant yield. And that's why it was kind of ironic for me to hear, you know, younger progressives uh, making that argument. It, it, you know, it's crazy, like how things go full circle. But the, the thing it, for me in terms of a response is, because I want people to understand 
there's no doubt that that constant yield and, and because of assessments, your property taxes are going up. But when you look across the board at the actual um, uh, taxable impact that our citizens receive, you know, in comparison to uh, neighboring jurisdictions, you will see that in terms of actual tax taxable impact, our numbers are, are on the lower end. You know, I mean, and that's what I think you need to look at. And the point I'm making is, it's clear, our primary source generally of revenue is income taxes and property taxes. But not, but this is dissimilar to um, other jurisdictions, you know, like Prince George's County, you know, that, that tax their uh, residents on far more uh, uh, actual taxes than we do. And, and another example, the, the most clear for me, because I was in a discussion recently with uh, representatives from Northern Virginia, and I had forgotten that, you know, residents in Northern Virginia, they get taxed on, you know, their, their vehicles. You know, the, the, um, the vehicle, uh, there's a uh, valuation tax. You know, these are things that we don't have. And my point is, you know, nobody wants to see their taxes increase, nobody. But at the same time, a fair evaluation of where Charles County is, is to look at the, you know, the valuation and the actual taxable impact across the board and compare us to other jurisdictions. And I think you'll see that in terms of actual taxes, we don't pay as much as well, many of as our, our neighboring jurisdictions. And one thing that, you know, I will agree with you with is that I don't mind the higher taxes. I don't mind the higher property tax rate if I see the amenities that come with it. I've lived in, Al in, um, in Alexandria. You know, I I've pretty much lived all over this area. So I see what they have. I, I see the fruits of their labor, the fruits of the taxes. We don't, you know, I'm just speaking for me. I don't see it here. And one of the things that a lot of residents are, I wouldn't necessarily say demanding, but they're saying, hey, with all this money, why don't we have a, a multi sports plex or something like that? And I know we had discussions about the Capitol Clubhouse, which is currently owned by the county, but I think it's leased out to another company. And I just wanted to share something real quick. And this really didn't happen during your administration, but the. Uh, technology. Uh, here it is. These are the discussions that I've had with um, the community and it's particularly the younger people is there's a lack of larger or more not modernized sports multi-complex for our youth. Now, and you, you probably know this, but just for those that are watching, you know, Capitol Clubhouse is 90,000 square feet. And we have a two-story Capitol Clubhouse we have an ice rink. Now, this is just what I assume because I've been in there. I don't know a lot of residents from Charles County using that, but I know the ones I've spoken with come from St. Mary's and Calvary, but that's a whole different conversation for a different day. You know, it has a fitness and cooking area, and it also has, also has a 30, 37,000 square foot gym floor. When you look at the renovations that could have been in there, 10 professional portable courts between six ten dollars $10,000, Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, it would have been a fraction of the cost to turn that into a multi or a mini multi sports complex compared to this, the senior multi generation center that I believe we purchased for four million dollars um, by you know personal project. So we're talking about our tax dollars and how they're spent to benefit Charles County what we want. Right. Yes, I'm not saying the seniors didn't need a, a multi-generation center, but that is the old sport and health. And I know for a fact that it could have been far more accommodated in the Capitol Clubhouse. Right. So the question for you is what is in the plans to give us something that our tax dollars can not only benefit from, but the youth can benefit from? And, that, and that's why I really wanted to raise the issue of the budget, because it, one of the highlights of this budget, and it should be put in the context of, you know, of the recent higher um, 
that actually came from Prince George's County. Her name is Kelly Beavers, and she's in charge of our, you know, our um, Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Department. Um, in the budget that we just approved is a, um, the beginning of, in our capital budget for an aquatic center. She was in, and Miss Beavers was instrumental in that aquatic center, in, you know, the, uh, the development of the aquatic center in Brandywine. And she's bringing that expertise to the county. So in our in this FY 2023 budget, there will be an aquatic center. Now it may not be and have the capacity of um, the Brandywine Center, but it will be similar in scope. And I and I think that's something that you know that our residents should be you know uh, proud of because you know the planning is in place to begin looking at that and and. And I just want to add, you know, going back to the discussion on taxes, that is an, an additional tax for those amenities, you know, to have these great centers. You know, other jurisdictions actually create additional taxes. Like in um, Prince George's County, you pay a parks tax, you know, to pay um, for that, that investment in those amenities because it, it's, it's extremely costly not only to construct you know, an aquatic center, but also in addition to, to be able to maintain it, you know, through maintenance. So, so answering your question directly, I, I totally agree with you. And I, I think we've certainly made a concerted effort to look at, you know, how tax dollars are being used and the fact that that type of, um, you know, multi-purpose um, regional larger um, uh, uh, center is what we need in our community because our citizens have been demanding that. And I, but I want to make it clear that is in our FY 2023 budget to begin, you know, the planning obviously and moving forward with this, with your capital budget, you create a five-year plan for construction. And do so you, that's in our five-year plan. Do you think there's any chance that the Capitol Clubhouse could be turned into something many? Because and the reason I said because I, I used to be a former junior college coach, I referee basketball, so I, I've toured a lot of facilities, and we have more we we have far more more space than any of those facilities, and with mm -hmm. a minor renovations, you could attract so much. And I, I can't speak on the management there, but I know that they're not AAU type people. Not if you got an ice rink. You talking about at the um. At the Capitol Clubhouse, okay. where you know where everyone could benefit, it's just the floors, the the those just you're not going to get an AAU tournament there based on what they have. So mm -hmm. maybe it's somewhere down the road we can look at it. But mm -hmm. now I want to, um, you know, as you talked about the uh, Aqua Center, I I believe Senator Ellis mentioned, uh, I think a couple of days ago about an amphitheater, amphitheater. I can't get the word out that's supposedly on the books. I don't think the county is paying that. Maybe the state is paying for it. Do you, is that part of the Waldorf beautification project? That's something different. I mean, I think it's in line with that. What, um, there's been an interest in um, establishing more of a presence and you know, more of a footprint for public space in Waldorf. Now, the challenge with that is Waldorf is our primary development district. And it's difficult to really find property within uh, Waldorf property that would be appropriate uh, for, you know, open space, you know, uh, parks and, and larger facilities. We have in the capital budget a, um, a Waldorf um, park, um, but it's not, it's more closer to like White Plains, but it, it would serve Waldorf primarily. But the um, amphitheater in that concept um, was something that has been reviewed, um, but Senator Ellis has really kind of taken that on as something as an interest on his part. And from my understanding, as you were stating, it looks like the, um, you know, we're receiving funding from the state to make that, that uh, a reality. And I, I think having that kind of urban type park, you know, in the heart of, you know, our, our you know, the development district, I think that's something that would be very um, exciting for our residents, you know. 
Yeah, and, and, and I agree. Um, I'd be curious of, you know, even with the construction, of because I know with amphitheaters, you have to dig in. <laughs> so, you know, where, you know, hopefully, you know, once they do the land survey and all that, that it can, you know, look like a quote unquote amphitheater because I all the ones I've been to, um, they're on a decline. So um, hopefully that will be something that will come in the future. Um, I know one of your uh, one of your passions is uh, youth employment. So um, would you, uh, being a commissioner president, I know you wanted to reinstate uh, the summer youth pro program. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we, we did. We actually, and we've actually increased the funding for that. So more Charles County youth, you know, have an opportunity to, to, to actually receive a summer job. And I, I mean, I wish I was as savvy as you are, because then I would be able to kind of share the links. But I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll send that to you in email because we have the links. We have two programs that provide. Um, uh, bring, bring it up. Let me see if I can bring it up. Oh, okay. talking. I see her in the background. It's too late. Yeah. That's technology. Mm -hmm. You can say, oh, hello, Miss Collins. <laughs> 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 Actually, no, I, can't, I can't bring it up because it's uh, uh, okay. it's delaying. But you can go but ahead. You can, but I was going to say you can, um, you know, our children can receive uh, summer employment through our uh, the summer youth employment program, which is uh, managed by um, uh, the Southern Maryland Tri County um, Tri County Council of Southern Maryland. Um, but the county also has an internal. Um, internship program uh, for uh, youth as well. Um, the eligibility for the summer youth employment is 16 to 22, I believe. And the um, summer youth employment, I think that's for uh, high school kids. Okay. Uh, I think I might be able to bring it up. Give me a second. Uh, check. But I, you know, while, while you're looking at the other, I'd like, my goal is to see that program grow even further. I mean, it will be very difficult for us because we don't have the resources. Uh, but I'd like to see that, you know, where it's on par with uh, the District of Columbia Summer Youth Employment. I'd, I'd like to be able to say that any uh, young person that wants a summer job, you know, will receive one. But you know, we're gradually growing the program. And, you know, I think as time, you know, progresses, you know, we'll start looking at things we'll, and similar type ideas that um, in the larger jurisdictions where they they actually get the private sector to, to um, you know, to, to uh, donate, you know, so you can build uh, the program so you have more young people. Yeah, that's, that's definitely it. You know? Wait for the website to pop up. Mm -hmm. Where it went? Oh, there it is. So this is the one you're talking about right here. Oh, this yep. job there's. Yep. So yeah, but basically, if you go on, if you go on, what is it? Tri County Council for Southern Maryland. Right. And so you know, basically, I can give y'all the audience the time to look at the website. If you go on there, you can uh, find out about the summer employment. All right. So um, one of the uh, one of your other um, platform items is, um, and and if I've heard this because not not you know although I may be involved in a lot of social issues, I, I you know there's a lot of business on here, and with the increased, uh, I guess the permit processing, how has that significantly changed the way we do business here in Charles County? It's been streamlined, and it, this is really a process that, you know, it, it, it didn't begin, you know, within the last three and a half years. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of, um, of our planning uh, process, you know, because it lacked the kind of uh, interaction that made it uh, user friendly. Uh, it was really outdated in a lot of ways. Um, when you look at in other jurisdictions, you know, the, the process was more uh, seamless. 
Um, it, a lot of the information uh, that you had to come to the actual government building, and we saw examples throughout you know, the state of Maryland where that stuff could be done online. And so we've actually enhanced, you know, the overall process. Now the um, permit process is more seamless. And, and the result is in, uh, feedback that we're receiving from uh, business uh, uh, owners uh, that, you know, look at that more favorably, because I, I think that that's very important. When, if you can expedite the process somewhat, you know, it, it creates a uh, more positive environment uh, to attract uh, uh, developing businesses here in the community. So that that's a direct advantage, I think, that we've seen. Uh, I think also because with this Board of Commissioners, we've, we've taken a position that, you know, we want to encourage business development, you know, and, and I think that kind of message has resonated. And I, and I think it was really, you know, contrary to a lot of feedback that was re received, you know, the previous four years, you know, where the impression was, you know, there was an interest in really trying to stop, you know, progress that existed in the county. And, and we were very specific in uh, um, recognizing a strong and robust uh, local economy is what we really needed. And we wanted to really focus on commercial development more than anything else. And that's why you talked about the permit process. You also talked about investments um, coming directly uh, from our economic development department to assist uh, small and developing businesses uh, to, to prosper. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that for me really showed this Board of Commissioners uh, commitment uh, to provide an opportunities for every citizen to, to do well and to really prosper as business owners was to actually do a disparity study, to look at the county's procurement process. You know, you know I think it's unprecedented for a county our size to actually commit a half a million dollars to doing a disparity study. And I, I know you you do a lot of research. I I can't, I have not seen a county our size that has done a disparity study. And, you know, and that is, you know, that will benefit our citizens for years to come, you know, to do a disparity study for those that may not be aware. It, it's the process that's necessary because if you don't do it, you cannot, um, make like, um, you know, goals for minority, um, uh, minority business enterprise um, programs. You can't make those goals, you know, beyond just goals, you know, you, yeah, because if you don't have a disparity study in place, you can be sued. You can be sued for, you know, discrimination. You yeah, know, something similar to what we have in the federal government, where each year there are certain goals when it comes to minority uh, contractors and things of that nature. And we know it's there. We just don't, like you said, we just don't have the evidence to support it. And, you know, especially when, when dealing with prime contracting, and I think that's uh, one of the things that Delegate Wilson had touched on too from the state level, which has trickled down to the county level. And it is, you know, for the viewers to look up to think about it, it, it is disheartening when you have pretty much a minority majority county, but I'm, I don't know what the percentage is, but I guarantee it's probably 10%. The numbers are guaranteed. I would guarantee yeah. that. You, you close, the numbers are ugly. Yeah. So, and I mean, and you know, and what's interesting, a large percentage of, you know, even when we look at minority uh, firms that are receiving contracts, a large, the lion's share of them are actually uh, women, white women owned businesses, you know, because that, that is considered, you know, part of, you know, uh, the uh, established definitions used by the state of Maryland, which we follow. And so we recognize, and in the disparity study, it showed that um, there's a serious uh, uh, lack. And part of it is the county has not done, you know, 
uh, as good enough job to get the word out there about potential opportunities for procurement. And that, that was one of the biggest things that the disparity, disparity study concluded, that we have to do a better job getting the word out. And we also have to get rid of um, kind of outdated um, you know, procedures, you know, with, with some of the larger contracts where, you know, the, these old, older firms that have done business in the county for years have kind of taken advantage of the process, you know, because they, you know, they work and done business in the county for years. And so as a result of that, you know, the county is comfortable with them, but the county has to do more to open the door to a lot of these newer uh, uh, firms that are um, that are interested in doing business here. Yeah, you know? and they gotta have the bid processes too. You know, you yeah. have op contracts with an option year, and then once that term is up, then you, you have to you know put in your bid like everybody else, like they're doing the federal level. So it brings me to another point to kind of piggyback off one another. Sorry, to kind of piggyback off one another, where you have the uh, during your administration with your administration, you were hired a chief. Uh, equity officer, we we have the business side, but now we're dealing with the actual jobs. Um, can you uh, explain that a little bit and why it was important to um, hire a chief equity officer? There were two things when I when I first walked in the building. I mean, in benefiting from you know two terms previously representing Waldorf, I understood that um, diversity wasn't a serious issue in the county. And, and so from the very beginning, I was really asking questions about what, what do we have in terms of numbers to see? Because I anecdotally, you know, I get, you know, you kind of go in, you know, and you're like, okay, the numbers don't really, just when you visualize uh, who's in the buildings, who's representing the county, you know, anecdotally, you kind of reach the conclusion that, well, you know, maybe we're not as diverse as we should be. Um, and so it was important for me to begin the process of actually looking at, you know, what the numbers were. And the creation of this new um, department, this new chief equity officer, I think is a major um, investment and I think it's something that will be beneficial to our citizens, you know, and for future years to come. Because the chief equity officer is essentially an individual that is given the task of really addressing, you know, issues associated with di diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ensuring that, you know, the entire operation of county government pr provides opportunities for growth and advancement for every single citizen. And, and part of the work that's done by um, a chief equity officer also um, spills directly out to the community and, and the interaction that government has uh, with the community. But but when, I, when the numbers started coming in, the first report that came from that office was really kind of staggering because what it showed was over 70% of Charles County's uh, workforce um, is um, it's white women, you know? I it's mean- Charles County government, it's about Charles, Charles County government. Charles County government, yes. It's white women, you know, I and- say, you probably say board educate, well, probably Charles County public schools too, might be as well. You probably, you're probably right. And, and so, you know, that now, the reality is that shows we got a long way to go. You know, I mean, in, when looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, but you gotta, you gotta have an idea where you are before you can address what the, the potential solutions are, you know, and, and that was another commitment I think, you know, this board of commissioners made that, you know, to say, to ask the tough questions and say, well, let's see where we are. That's how we can resolve issues, you know, and make our, our county run more equitably. You know, I mean, by knowing what the problems are, you know, it wasn't pretty, you know, nobody really wanted to see that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we know and now we're in a position where we can begin to address um, these disparities that exist. Yeah, and I agree, especially when you look at the large, well, I would say large, but fairly large percentage of where the tax dollars are coming from. So if, if the tax dollars are coming from the likes of, you know, people who look like you and I, to some degree, we expect some representation 
in government, some representation, maybe in the school system, whatever it may be, even with contract, whatever it may be. So the, the last uh, thing that I want to touch on is sort of a combination of housing and traffic because they kind of play hand in hand, but it brings us to light rail. Now here we've, we've had agreements with the light rail, disagreement with the light rail. My, my, I guess, disagreement is that we're nowhere near the population that will require it. That's just my opinion, because I've been to certain areas where we don't even have a half of the population, mm -hmm. but then we, we got funding, I guess, to do a study or a plan. I don't know when the light, were, and really the, and for the audiences um, listening, it's, it's a light rail that will connect us to the metro. It's not necessarily a light rail. We just ride back and forth in Charles County. So it's going to connect us to the Branch Avenue Metro. So what is the county's part in the light rail? Okay. Uh, not, not the state, but the county's part as far right. as taxpayers. What, are, right. what would be our eventual part? Well, I mean, just to create context, uh, and I would totally agree with your position that we don't have the population. And if the studies and if the assessments were looking exclusively at Charles County, it would never happen because we wouldn't have the population. But the, um, the Southern Maryland Rapid Transit um, alignment studies that have been put in place and the funding that we received, funding commitments from the state and federal government now um, are put uh, in the perspective that Southern Maryland Rapid Transit is the alignment is three fourths um, Prince George's County. You know, most of the alignment is actually Prince George's County heading north on 301. There, um, it's projected to be about 18 miles, the actual line itself, but nearly three fourths of that line is in Prince George's County, or definitely like two thirds depending on you know, how you look at it. So when you look at 301 and the 301 corridor, it's, it's one of the most highly congested. Some of the estimates are, you know, in, you know, in any given day, over 400,000 um, uh, um, commuters, you know, are um, exposed to 301. And so that's really, that's creating like the footprint of what, you know, these studies are based on. And it becomes, I talked about equity also. This is one of the interesting uh, elements to seeing uh, Southern Maryland Rapid Transit move forward because it is essentially an equity issue. When you look at the combining of Prince George's and Charles County, those two jurisdictions are um, based on the most recent cen census, you know, two of the, the most um, prosperous um, predominantly African-American uh, populations in the entire nation. And Charles County in particular, as it relates to equity and what, you know, having um, a light rail or a transit, what that would do to our local economy is something that is essentially a, a, um, a uh, equity issue. And, and even further, and this is something that I've learned through the years being um, a, a board member of um, the Metropolitan Washington and Council of Governments, it's also an issue that, that would impact climate change. Uh, by having, uh, you know, an alternative a transportation uh, source, it would, it would drastically reduce, at least potentially, I mean, let me be clear, potentially, the number of vehicles that are on the roads. And that, that would have a, a positive impact on, on you know, the, in, in reducing actual emissions that, you know, are impacting you know, our citizens in particular, you know, and so that's where you look at it in the context of being an equity issue also. And communities that uh, have uh, rapid transit, you know, you see an increase in uh, property values. Our county, we're already uh, distinguished as being um, a wealthy community, you know, and, and, you know, and I heard you, and I, I mean, I take very serious when I hear you know, arguments such as yours that, you know, we got to do more to show the citizens you know, that wealth. I mean, and I think that's a legitimate um, uh, challenge 
for our county moving forward. So I, I don't disagree with that, but I think having an amenity like rail, you know, will actually provide more opportunities and it will actually increase the valuation of people's properties here in the county. And I, you know, you got me on this. I, you know, one of the biggest criticisms I hear from residents are they're concerned that it's going to increase um, uh, 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 crime. And that, yeah, you know, I and, that, that's, and that, that's all, and it's all, but <laughs> this is the scenario that I see, uh, uh, Terry. Okay, so someone, and you know, I'm, I was, I'm reading this book now. They were talking about, you know, um, the expansion of, um, you know, rail in Baltimore City. And there was a line that was supposed to connect it to Anne Arundel County. And one of the arguments, this was in the 1960s. And one of the arguments was, well, you know, we don't want any, you know, from Anne Arundel, we don't want anything that's tied to Baltimore coming, you know, to Anne Arundel County. And if you recall also, <laughs> it, check it out with, um, with Metro in the district. You notice that there's not uh, Metro that, um, that services Georgetown. Because at the time, people didn't want, people from Georgetown didn't want that connection of Metro in their communities. And, and so that same argument, we're hearing this from some of our residents, that somehow, the, and, and this is what's kind of crazy to me. So somebody's gonna come from the district, you know, to ride a rail all the way down to Waldorf, you know, then, you know, you know, get, get into what they ever get into, and then going to go a half an hour trip back. I mean, well, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's just kind of <laughs> hard for me to, to yeah. get with that scenario, man. But you know, yeah. I, it it is very difficult. And I've I've wrote, written the light rail in Baltimore down Howard Street and all that. It is very difficult to commit a crime and get <laughs> off the light rail, <laughs> and then, you know, to get off. And you know, to your point. Crime is going to come if it's going to come regardless. But a common criminal is not going to catch Branch Avenue, get on there, go all the way down here, commit a crime just to get back on light rail and go up there. <laughs> they're going to drive or they, you know, whatever they're going to do. So it, it may be scare tactics. And, you know, and I agree with you. We do need it. I just don't think we need it right now. But mm -hmm. if the planning takes what it takes to get it, once we get to that point, then I can understand it. So, uh, and there's a lot of other things I wish we could get into, but let me, uh, I'm going to bring this up for the viewers. Ooh, my technology gets to me. Uh, and, uh, so everyone can see, I put this together, like it. <laughs> but uh, if you want to get more information on uh, Commissioner Collins, um, um, platform you can go on there you touch on a lot of other things um, dealing with broadband homelessness um, you know interfaith council criminal justice reform there's a lot of things that um, you can go on his website to look at but before, but before we go I'm not sure if you've seen my show I always close out before you close out I always close out with, with the word games and I, I mention a word and you say what comes to your mind whether it's a word or a sentence Okay, so you ready? I, All right. I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this one, but go ahead. All right, Charles County. Prosperity. All right, Waldorf. The highest potential for positive development. Social justice. Continuing the work that's being done um, as it relates to criminal justice reform. United States Air Force Academy. <laughs> my, my son right now, who I'm very proud of. All right, Fisk University. My alma mater and the alma mater of John Lewis and W.E.B. Du Bois. Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. That is where I pledged at Fisk University and that's the chapter Alpha Delta chapter that I'm a member of Kappa Alpha Psi for life. All right, and the last word, drum roll, Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I mean, that, 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 you're putting it on a sour note, but I, <laughs> but I, you know, I'm gonna tell you, I, the period when uh, Michael Irvin and um, Troy and um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, the Emma running Smith. back, Emma Smith. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I, I respected them so much, man, because they were so good. I mean, y'all I had the hogs. Y'all had the hogs. I remember that era when y'all had the hogs. I, 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 those John those Reagan, were some beast organizations. Yeah. You know, and I, I just remember they were good, man, and they, they knew they were good. Nobody could really beat them, man, you know? All right, so as we close out, um, like I told all candidates, um, is there any way I can help out with your platform, uh, get the information out, you let me know, but I'm not in any way endorsing any candidate. My thing is I'm just here to give people an opportunity to see who you are. So as we close, I'm that voter that walks up to you. Why should I vote to reelect Ruben Collins as Charles County president? Because we want to continue the forward trajectory that we've seen the last three and a half years. This is not the time for us to go backwards. Uh, too often in this county's history, you know, we've punched well below our weight. We've never fully recognize the potential that exists for Charles County. We are becoming a major player in the metropolitan region. Now's not the time to go backwards. We gotta continue to move forward. Opportunities exist here to see this county become a leader. And, and that's what I wanna be a part of. And I, and I think when you look at the numbers, and that's the way I really wanna close, when you're making decisions, look at the numbers because you've seen with this administration, you've seen measurable progress. You know, you don't have to take my word for it. And that that's another thing that I thought was important for us, you know, that we really look at, you know, measurable results that the citizens can look at so they can say for themselves, well, yeah, the county's doing better. Well, once again, I, I thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, for, this will uh, air Tuesday, but we are here on a Sunday. Nice day outside, but I definitely appreciate you taking the time uh, to come on and, and share your vision um, as you seek re-election. Re um, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll see you and others on the campaign trail. But uh, until then, um, you take care. Tell the family I said hello and uh, wish you well. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, mm -hmm. once again, I want to thank uh, Commissioner President Collins, uh, who's running for re-election, uh, for coming on the show. And uh, hopefully you got something out of it. But like I tell everybody, look at all your candidates. See um, what candidate platform works for you. Their websites are there available. I, I encourage you to reach out to them and uh, arrange a meeting, conversation, something. But get to know the candidates and get to know where they stand on certain issues. And I'm going to tell you, you are not going to agree with them 100% of the time. If you do, something's wrong with you. This is my personal opinion. It's not going to happen. I don't agree with any of them. You know, I was actually being nice because you know, me and Ruben had some heated discussions. But that's what I respect about him and any other candidate is that we can agree to disagree. And he'll learn something from me. I learned something from him. But we all learn. So until then, catch the next episode. Peace and blessings. Blaze the path.